I used to live in North Village and it was 01003. Yeah, that's part of the UMass zip code. Um, right, so I'm recording this just so everyone knows that's here in attendance and there's a few in the um, few members of the public and then okay. uh, yeah. Okay, Nate, I just sent out uh, to you and a few <laughs> others the uh, file that Rita prepared for discussion of the draft RFP. I sent out the wrong it. thing a little earlier. So it's oh. my oh. last email. So if you could put that on screen when we get to it, I think that would yeah. help facilitate the discussion. Right, let me just check. Yeah, so you, you sent three items in one email. Oh no, looks like I see a second, it's, another one. Yeah, All right. Yeah, it's just a single item. This has not yeah. been my best week, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> We'll forgive you, John. Thanks. Rita. Absolutely. I'm not sure I forgive myself. <laughs> That's usually the hardest person to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I already told Nate that uh, Sid and Paul are not going to join us. So uh, I lost the, let's see. So are we close to getting a quorum? Yeah, we have um, six, one, two, mm -hmm. six, six members six. here. Yep. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> okay, so I guess we can get started. Uh, who are we missing? Francis. Francis, okay. She, she'll probably right, be on. Yeah, she just, jo she just joined. Okay, great. But Zoom's really slow right now. To, uh... Okay, so we'll get started. Um, first, my first order of business is to apologize because I thought I had sent everybody a note two or three days ago and I don't have the note in my files. So chances are you don't have it either. Um, and it had a group of attachments that you should have had two days ago, which you don't have. So we'll have to manage without that somehow. Uh, anyway, my apologies. Uh, I'll try to do better next month. Uh, let's see. The first announcement was uh, the first announcement. I wanted to uh, welcome our new member, Allegra Clark. Uh, and she's on screen waving. Uh, Allegra uh, is not a, an immigrant, as far as I know, unless you count coming from Boston as being an immigrant. Uh, actually, she does continue a trend of adding younger members to the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, in, on, I, I also count Will and Francis to that. So I think in the last year or two, we've managed to get a little younger, maybe a little faster, I don't know, uh, as far as the board as a whole. So I'm glad we have that uh, change in age diversity. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about Allegra, and then I'll let her introduce herself, is that she brings experience working with people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, and also with people who are in need of behavioral health services. And since Jay Levy uh, and uh, Nancy Schroeder moved off the board, we haven't had somebody with that kind of experience and expertise. So I'm glad that Allegra has joined us and I'll give you a chance to say a bit more about who you are. Uh, hi, I'm Allegra Clark. I am, let's see. I'm excited to be back in the Amherst area. I graduated from the high school in the early 2000s um, and lived in Boston for a while. And while I was there, I did work for about four years at a housing and homelessness services agency. And I was mainly focused on homeless prevention services. And um, I also completed my master's in social work so I'm a licensed social worker. I currently work um, primarily with justice-involved populations and people seeking civil commitments for mental health and substance use. Um, and right now that's remote work. 
it's kind of all over Western Mass. So um, I'm just excited to be getting more involved in my local community and getting back into my interest in affordable housing. Yeah, actually, Allegra reminds me of something Rita told me earlier this week that another former graduate of Amherst Regional High School has gone on to bigger and better things. I don't know if anybody knew Arthur Jemison. Um, I knew Arthur because he was in my son's graduating class and Jeremy and Arthur were friends. Uh, Arthur is now uh, like an assistant deputy secretary in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He's been involved in housing and other urban planning issues in the city of Detroit for, I don't know, the last 20 years or something like that. He's been in Detroit for seven years. Before that, he was at DHCD. Okay. It's only seven years? I thought it was Only longer. seven years, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Erica. So anyway, that's pretty nice. Amorous boy makes good. Um, maybe we can hit him up for some HUD funds. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think okay. I told told you, John, I, I believe, and, and Arthur, when um, Olympia Oaks was dedicated, Arthur um, spoke on behalf of DHCD. And I believe at that time, he said he grew up in subsidized housing in Amherst, too. Wow. It's kind of a powerful, um, yeah, story. He had a is a really interesting story. Well, maybe we can invite him back when we open up uh, Belchertown Road East Street School Affordable Housing Development. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be neat. So, Allegra, just one quick thing. The, um, if you haven't received it yet, the town should be mailing out information for you as a new member. And you'll have to uh, take an online training for open meeting law and ethics and then get sworn in um, with a town clerk, which I think they are still doing in person outside town hall, but uh, in the mailing, uh, you should receive, you know, steps on how to do all this. But if you don't by um, like Wednesday or Thursday next week, email me and we can, you know, figure it out. Man, so Nate, just to, just to clarify, so Allegra is not an officially on the trust, so she's not a voting member. Oh, you know, yet. she's been appointed, but um, not okay. sworn in yet, so. Um, that's a nice city we can overlook. Yeah, <laughs> the, and the mail is slow. I will say we, the town sometimes it's taking, it'll take a week sometimes for local mail to be delivered. So sometimes we mail things on Friday and people don't get it till Thursday or the following Friday, which seems really okay. slow, but that's just the way it's been. Um, so. Um, so I had, had one other thing I wanted to mention. I think everybody may know that the governor's housing choice bill passed as part of the economic development bill. And that's generally good news. I want to, I looked through actually a chapel presentation, which is lengthier than what I'm going to do. Um, but it included uh, uh, a number of things, a few of which I wanted to highlight because I do think they they may affect Amherst. First of all, most zoning changes now only require a 50% majority of the uh, planning board and the town council. It used to be two thirds, which meant that it was much more difficult to make those changes. Also, I think as the law was originally drafted, there was an opt in or opt out provision for local government that no longer exists everybody is automatically opted in. So nobody has to actually act to make sure that we're in the pool. Another thing that's important, I believe, is that uh, multifamily, which means three or more units and mixed use in quote unquote eligible locations are now by right, according to the change in state statute. So that gives developers in the town more flexibility. Uh, there still are other things like mixed uses that likely uh, will require a special permit. 
uh, if it's outside the quote unquote eligible location, which is probably determined by the town. Uh, the other thing is the 50% rule extends to a number of things in particular. Um, it includes a review of a special permit to enable a project to reduce parking spaces to allow for the creation of additional units. So we've already been talking about having one parking space per unit at East Street and Belchertown Road, which is inconsistent with the existing zoning bylaws. Now it looks to me, if I understand it properly, uh, if there's a special permit before the ZBA, only 50% of the ZBA would have to vote to approve that. And uh, the last thing is there are more restrictive rules around who and under what circumstances people can protest a decision to grant a special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So I think that's all, all good for the future of affordable housing in Amherst. So those are my announcements. Does anybody have anything else they want to add at this point? Well, John, I think in the bill too was that um, maybe the trust is aware, but there's $250,000 coming to the housing trust. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, it still has to be released and everything, but, um, you know, potential 250000 to the trust for just general development and then another 250000 to Amherst, the town of Amherst, um, for affordable units that meet a LEED certification, which may or may not be a challenge, but at least, you know, there is some money there for uh, affordable housing. Yep, and those were put in the bill by Mindy Dom mm -hmm. with support from Joe Comerford. Yeah, and I will say, John, in terms of all the other the zoning and other requirements, we are um, the town's attorney, KP Law, you know, represents a number of communities and they're looking into it. They've had one brief on it, on the, the bill. It, it is interesting the town probably meets a lot of the, the requirements of the bill already. Um, and so some of its interpretation or you know, one of their opinions, I was surprised to see how narrow, <laughs> how narrow their uh, legal, you know, legal review is of the bill. So, um, you know, for instance, they have a size for supplemental dwelling units or accessory dwelling units saying that they can be half the size of the floor area of a unit or like 900 square feet. Um, and then the town has that has a, allows accessory dwelling units, but we have different square foot requirements. And one of the attorneys one, from KP Law was just, I think in something they sent out to a few towns said that if you have different size units, then it's different than what the bill has. So you don't have to follow the majority vote. Um, so it's really interesting. It's really interesting. I, um, I just saw it this afternoon. And so when you brought this up, John, I made a note. I want to just circle back with... Um, the planning director and then the building commissioner and maybe follow up with an attorney about some of those because I thought uh, the town would have to, might need to comply uh, and change our zoning, but maybe not. So it's just, I, you know, it's interesting. Some of the language in the bill is a little vague and so it might take a year <laughs> or I don't know, <laughs> someone pushing to determine uh, how it applies. So I agree like eligible area. So the bill just says, um, in eligible areas, these things need to be by right. And they define an eligible area as a village center, a town center, an area that's you know, mildly populated or densely populated near a transit station, near public transportation. And it's like, well, it, it doesn't define that area. So is it a quarter mile? Is it a half mile? Is it a whole neighborhood? And so, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, so some of those things are just, you know, someone's gonna have to write, write it down what they think it means and then. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's, that's interesting. Um, Janet McGowan, who's on the planning board has been pushing or trying to push the development of accessory dwelling units mm -hmm. uh, for at least a couple of years, maybe longer. And uh, it's something that simply hasn't happened to any great extent in Amherst, as far as I know. So even though the bylaw has been there for a few years, right. people have not been taking advantage of it. 
Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think that's because they're um, kind of small. We the, the town restricts the size and then they're by special permit. So staff is looking at changing that or, you know. Okay. And then one um, other announcement, it's coming up a little bit later, but just so the trust knows, you know, the town and the trust are working together and it looks like the um, purchase of the Belcher Town Road property will happen um, next week, Tuesday next week or so. So it's, um, yeah, I think the, you know, town, the town signed off on everything. And I think it's really just a matter of process now. So I think we're, I think that's really in motion. So. Yeah, I recall the documents were being worked on and I've just sort of assumed it's a fait accompli and stop thinking about it. Oh no, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think okay. today the I think the final all the things were signed and ready. So I think I think we're good. But until that happened, you know, until those things are finally signed, we can't say it's good. So okay. So um, I think we should welcome Jana, uh, Jana Tetro to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can spend a little bit of time updating what's happening with the rental, emergency rental assistance program. Mm -hmm. There you are. Hi, Jana. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Uh, do you want? <laughs> You want me to give my brief update? And yes. Or do you want to talk about the other thing that you want me to talk about? We should talk about both, I think. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I don't have a very long update for you um, this evening. Um, I will say that we've, since my last update last month, um, we've gotten, we've received nine more applications. Um, and so it's slowed down a little bit. I mean, we've had some, you know, ups and downs over the course of the application period. Um, we've also had, I would say at least four, maybe five um, applicants who received money already in round two, who are asking for an additional three months. So um, we are, we're not making those folks fill out another online application, but we are, you know, working, getting updated documentation, having discussions with them, um, so they're not included in that nine. Um, so we have, I would say about four of those folks who still need some help and are looking for additional assistance. So we're working through those. Wait, just quickly. So those are people who are, who are helped in round two, not round one, but they still need help. So they're from round two. They're from round two yeah. and they got three months of assistance and they are still, they're requesting another three months. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've also had um, some of those folks and then other folks too, who are also in the process of applying for raft and are mostly still waiting to hear the status of their raft application. So we have been, uh, sometimes we help folks with the raft application if they need help. Other folks have applied for it on their own. Um, we've been successful in a couple of cases in getting some updates from Wayfinder staff um, applicants do get emails from Wayfinders like as their application progresses through the process, but it takes about six to eight weeks. And so um, that's a long time. So, you know, it's just helping people, you know, wait and see if there's anything we can do in the meantime. Um, and then uh, the issue that I, John and Nate and I have talked about that I was wanted to bring forward tonight um, is a request to change one of the eligibility or alter one of the eligibility guidelines. So currently we have a, one of the guidelines, I'm gonna read it to you so I don't mess it up. Um, says households must demonstrate a need for assistance. Households with sufficient income and or savings to pay their monthly rent will not be eligible. Some savings is allowable. And, um, so as you may recall, we have this sort of complicated formula that we use to figure out if they have sufficient income to pay their rent. And we've had a few cases where the person owes arrears. So they, they're already behind and they don't really have any savings. Maybe they have a couple hundred dollars in their savings account, but their income is sufficient to pay their rent going forward but it doesn't mean that it's sufficient enough to cure their arrears on their own. 
And so I had brought this issue up um, to Nate and John because we had a woman who was denied and appealed it. Um, and the appeals, the community action policy is there's a different, there's another supervisor who manages the program and then they appeal, if someone appeals, they appeal it directly to me. Um, and I really wanted to approve this person because it made sense, but we had already denied about four other people for this same problem where they really didn't have a lot of savings, but they, and they were in arrears, but they, the math made it seem like they could have afforded their rent. So um, what I talked to John and Nate about is to sort of making an exception for people who are already in arrears. So if you are applying for monthly rent going forward, we would use the same formula to determine if you have sufficient income or assets to pay your rent going forward. But if you are applying for help with your arrears, that in and of itself has demonstrated a need because you likely did, could not pay your arrears because you don't have any other resources. Um, so that's what I wanted to bring to you all tonight. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions, but we had, we've had, there were four or five people in this category um, that we've sort of gone back to. In some cases, they still were very complicated and probably just should apply to RAFT because they owed a lot of money. Um, but we, you know, we want to be able to go back and help some of those folks that we denied previously for this reason. Does anyone have questions? Uh, Nate and I both thought this was a good idea. I think what it means is, and maybe I'll make a motion to this effect, that uh, we would be changing our guidance so that it would read, applicants must have insufficient income and or assets to pay their rent for three months or arrears while applying for monthly rental assistance. Would, would that do it, Jana? I would say something like um, applicants must, uh, applicants with suffi sufficient income or assets. So I would s separate it so that it's clear that if you're applying for monthly rent, you must demonstrate a need and you can't have sufficient income or assets. I would maybe take out that, not mention arrears in the same sentence, because I think that what you read back to me sort of indicates that those people would still not be eligible. Okay, um, sorry. No, that's okay. I, I had, where's the email that I sent that had some suggested language? Oh, here it is. Um, applicants must have insufficient income and or assets to pay their rent for three months when applying for monthly rent assistance. That's, that I thought that's, that's a description of the current eligibility requirements. Well, I want to make it, that is, but I, the other one doesn't, the current one doesn't say when applying for monthly rent assistance. So I, we could add something. Yeah, Carol, you have a suggestion. <laughs> well, applying for monthly rent assistance still doesn't specify what you said talking to us, which is going forward. Yeah. Okay. So if even if you said, uh, apply for monthly rental assistance going forward. And then that kind of doesn't say anything about arrears. And maybe you want to say nothing about it. And maybe you want to, and maybe, so that seems clear. The question to me is whether, should there also be something said about arrears? I don't know. But anyway, I'd add going forward because it seems to me to make it clearer. Okay. Or we could say future rent when applying for That's future better. rent. That's less words. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we just kind of start over and use similar language when looking at it to say, um, applicants who have insufficient income and or assets to pay uh, their rent uh, that is in arrears uh, are also eligible uh, for an award or whatever the right language would be. So it's a separate sentence mm -hmm. and it establishes a second category of eligibility. I think we could 
could say something like assistance doesn't, you know, what is it? Households may be eligible for assistance with rent arrears or future rent or monthly rent. And then say applicants must have insufficient income and or assets um, to pay uh, insufficient income and or assets when applying for monthly rent. I mean, we'll know what it means, but I just want people to, and I don't think that the, quite frankly, applicants are not diving deep into these eligibility guidelines before they apply. No, I'm, I'm not concerned about applicants. I'm concerned about somebody else looking over the town shoulder and saying, right. why did you allow this? Would we say that, you know, for, for applicants in arrears, the income asset uh, test is waived. I mean, it could be as simple as that. Or does not apply. Right. That's, okay. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like if we clarify the other statement, you know, we could just have something as simple as like, whether we have it as another step, you know, statement or like a footnote or something. But yeah, I think it would be good to record this. Um, and it is a little bit of a moving target. It's not as bad as the micro enterprise program that the HCD is offering, which I will say, they just changed their guidelines today. They update FAQs and they don't tell you. And then you look and you see that they've changed some of their guidance. So I just, they threw a curveball to people today um, with some of their updates. Um, so I'm, I'm fine if we say something like that, like it's way for people in arrears and, you know, they still have to, I mean, at that point, you're still doing, you know, verifying that they owe a fair amount, right? I mean, we're, it's not, they still have to show that they, they need the, the funding, so. Right, so every, all the other guidelines would be the same. They still have to be income eligible. They, right, we, we always verify what the arrears are anyway, mm -hmm. um, but we wouldn't have to do this math equation <laughs> that then is knocking people, at, you know, like this one person that appealed, she had, you know, $100 in her savings account and owed three months of rent and we denied her because her income was sufficient. You know, it didn't really, she could still couldn't pay the back rent. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want, yeah, so we could say something like, you know, households in arrears, you know, this, is, this requirement does not apply for households in arrears or something. Yep. Okay. Rob, is there something you wanted to add? No? Okay. Okay, uh, I'll move that we adopt that language. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, great. So we should have a roll call vote. Uh, I'm a yes. I'll go to Carol. Yes. Uh, Allegra. Yes. Erica. Yes. Will. Will. Can't hear you. Yes. Okay. I think you're muted, Will. Francis? Yes. And Rob? Yes. Okay, that's great. Um, so, uh, Jana, is there any explanation that you have for why uh, applications have slowed down? Um, as I've said before, <laughs> I'm wrong every time I make a prediction. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's a it's a funny time. It's a funny thing. I mean, I, I was on a call yesterday with the raft providers and a whole bunch of other folks and, um, you know, raft is still like, there's still a lot of raft applications, but it's stabilizing a little bit more than it was before. Um, but, uh, Jen Derringer from community legal aid was on the call. And while they are very, very busy with people who have notices to quit. So people who are calling legal aid, the court process is taking a really long time. So even if the landlord has filed um, with the court, it takes several weeks for the court to even schedule the hearing. And then the hearings are six to eight weeks out. And so part of me wonders if it's still, you know, people don't, there's not a lot happening. Maybe they're not, tenants aren't getting a ton of notices. They're not getting badgered by their landlords. 
Um, I think Hamden County is really seeing a lot more activity than we are in Hampshire and Franklin County in terms of landlord, you know, eviction cases. But I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if you, I mean, I think I heard at the tail end of the conversation at the beginning about notifying landlords of the program. Like I don't, we don't hear from a lot of landlords. There's not a, la a lot of landlords. Landlords can apply to raft on behalf of their tenants. And that's not been a very popular thing to do. So I, I don't know. I just, it's a weird time. Um, so, um, are you okay keeping the program running? You know, we had voted last time to extend it and. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, you know, I, um, I think it's still meeting a need. You know, we are, East Hampton just launched their program. Um, you know, I think it's, they just, I think are a little smaller than we all anticipated, but yeah, I don't know. It's well, nine new applications plus four requests for additional three months is not nothing. So I'm comfortable with leaving the program continuing at this point. Uh, and yeah, and I will say for the people that, that you know, you all are helping with these funds there, I mean, it makes a huge difference. So even though the numbers aren't what we thought they would be, um, you know, we are, you are saving folks from, you know, becoming homeless and just also the stress of not knowing if they're going to get an eviction notice. So it is, it, it does make a huge difference. Okay, any additional questions or comments for Jana? Okay. okay, thanks very much for joining us again this evening. Thank you. And we'll be in touch. Okay, <laughs> have a good night. Thanks. Okay, I believe our next agenda item is the request for proposals that we're working on. And uh, Rita had prepared some talking points or discussion points really um, that reflect where the draft RFP working group is and I intended to send those out, and I kind of did five minutes before the meeting started. Which I'm going to pull those up, John. Uh, yeah. so, so Nate's going to show them to you on the screen. And my apologies, and <coughs> I'll ask Rita to lead the discussion of these points once they're available to everybody. <coughs> Okay, um, so first off, uh, just because I know this is new we'll to. Yeah, this is where we are, Rita. Yep. All right. Okay, um, I know this is new to Allegra. Um, the trust is working on a request for proposals for um, uh, parcels at Belchertown Road and then the East Street School to do a request for proposal for affordable housing. And there's a, I don't know if we're an official subcommittee of the trust, I'm a consultant to the trust, but there is a working group of trust members, which includes Carol, Francis, Erica, John and I have now had, I think two meetings. Two meetings. Two meetings um, to talk about um, the RFP. There was an RFP that was done for East Street School back a couple of years ago, um, we're starting with that RFP as kind of a template and making some, obviously some, some changes to now reflect it being uh, Belchertown Road sites, as well as East Street School um, in a new RFP, which we expect to issue um, this spring at some point. So um, what John had recommend that we do, and I think made a lot of sense was actually to kind of work a little bit backwards. And that is to start with the criteria that the things that we think are really important in these different categories, and then use those once we've established what those are and what the, the priorities are to then um, go back into the um, the RFP narrative and incorporate these, um, these criteria into there. So uh, it's been a great working group so far, uh, just a lot of really good ideas and a lot of good, good questions and, and back and forth. 
um, about um, some of the, the key categories. So what I've done here is, is I've picked, I think there are a total of maybe seven of the nine to six, six of the nine to 10 categories overall, the ones where I think, you know, perhaps the, there's the most discussion, should be the most discussion There has been certainly amongst the, the working group members and to kind of go through those um, this evening. And I would ask um, Francis, Erica and, and Carol to, to jump in here. Um, and I'm, I'll just step through each of these, each of these categories and, and what I've highlighted here. And then you know, we can open up the discussion. So one of the first things that we've talked about is whether or not to include um, market rate units in the proposal, as well as obviously the affordable units. And I think the consensus so far of the working group is yes. And what the nature of those um, non-affordable units is, you know, is, is, is up for discussion. So anything, we consider anything over 80% area median income would be a market rate unit. Do you want me to step through these one by? You want yeah, why to don't talk? you do A, B, C, D, E for affordability, and then we'll go back okay. and have a discussion. Oh, okay. Um, so that that really covers A and B um, to have some units that are actually at a hundred percent of area and median income, and for purposes of some uh, state funding, particularly mass housing funding, uh, workforce housing units are go up to. Um, 120 percent of area median income, I believe. Just FYI, um, the units on Belcher Town Road, anything that's built there, the maximum household income can only be at 100 percent of area median income because Belcher Town Road is being acquired with CPA funds for community housing, and the CPA income limit is 100 percent of AMI. Uh, what I think we, we do need to do in the, in the RFP is set some minimum number of affordable units and then give kind of a, a range to what we think the maximum number of units uh, would be for those two sites in that we would have affordable units, some affordable units at 30% of area, up maximum of 30% um, AMI and then um, the balance up to 60% of the area median income. And those requirements come directly out of the, something called the Qualified Action Plan, which is a document that's prepared by the Department of Housing and Community Development and is really the guidance for both, um, not, not only low income housing tax credit, but also other DHCD resources. And the assumption is that um, any developer responding to this RFP will have to, will be using DHCD resources. And the, so as we kind of went through a number of the criteria, we were aware of the, the QAP requirements and so have incorporated um, a number of those things into these guidelines. So I'll stop there and I don't know at first, Francis, Carol, Erica, if there's anything you want to add to this or there are questions from other trust members. Um, yeah, just very quickly, I think what we said was um, definitely have a, a minimum number of units based on just how much um, uh, just the economies of scale for developers. Um, I don't know if we... I think, yeah, I think there's still some discussion on how many, if we should say the number of maximum units total or minimum units mm -hmm, total. Mm -hmm. um, and as well as the affordability limits. Uh, can you remind me why we're not going up to 80% AMI? No, I'm just saying that it's not 80, it would be 60. And then from 60, um, anything 60 above 60. Yeah, yeah. Right, I just it. said the 80 because that is the, typically is the affordable. Right. Um, right. 
I think one of the things that certainly both Erica and Carol emphasized is that <clears throat> they did not want uh, a property that was segregated by income, that they wanted some diversity of income. And so if we can have a mix of 30% AMI, 60% and 200%, 100%, sorry, that gives us a significant diversity of income. Uh, obviously the preponderance of units would still be for low income folks, but uh, it does give us the opportunity to have some diversity of income and it would probably be more or less equally spread across the two properties because we can't have uh, the two properties be terribly different with respect to the income distribution. Apparently that would make DHCD unhappy from what Rita has said in the past. Well, actually, you know, I, I think that's a, we've heard that from some developers. It doesn't mean absolutely that we couldn't do some above 100% AMI, but, um, you know, for, for financing reasons that that might be where it lands. But don't you think, John, when you're speaking, I think, would we want to have a point that says um, to have the units, you know, roughly proportional um, between the sites because a developer could have a mix of income levels, but you know, but then between the two properties, but then keep, you know, segregate income levels. So one site is serving these two and, you know, I mean, if we're not, if we're not saying it, then, you know, whether or not the state likes it, a developer might not. So if we want to say to have, you know, a mix of incomes on both sites, I think we should say that just, you know, yeah, I agree. And I think that was the sense of our working group. Mm -hmm. I think with the acknowledgement that you can't go over 100% AMI on Belchertown Road. Are we, did we, do we, did staff agree with that, Rita? Is that, was that still up in the air? Or did Dave say he was okay with that? <laughs> I believe, <laughs> I believe that was the agreement. Yes. Yeah. John, do you concur? I, I do agree. I mean, there was some ambiguity for a while, but yeah. I think uh, once they realized that we may have difficulty getting financing if we didn't uh, uh, abide by that rule, right. then he said, yeah, that's what we should go ahead with. That it, <laughs> that it could be looked at by the lenders. Right. I mean, do you think it's, I mean, I know I like having the minimum number of units and having the affordability range and saying it's proportional to, between sites. I mean, do we then just leave the rest of the units up to the developer? I mean, do we do we want to prescribe up to 100 and up to 120, or is it would we make those as part of the comparative criteria? So maybe it's you know someone's more you know highly advantageous if they can work in you know 120 percent AMI or something. I mean, do we because otherwise I feel like if we start getting these different income brackets and we're getting really prescriptive, I mean we we just set the program like we you know we just Right. I mean, I think the I think the best way to word it is that we have a minimum number of units at 60% AMI and below, mm -hmm. and then we leave the balance up to the developers right. and understanding that that at Belchertown Road we have a maximum 100% AMI, right. and then let let them make the numbers work. And I think giving a developer that flexibility is going to um, result in better proposals for us. But should we say 30% too, like 60 to 30 to 60? I mean, if we just said 60 or less, would they include 30 or? Uh, you know, I've had mixed, um, typically the, you get 30 to 60, nobody wants to do <coughs> that many different um, right. unit, uh, unit uh, amounts or rent rent limits. It makes the renting up like a huge management headache. Right. So, you know, in the past we did ask for some units at 50% AMI and we got some really negative feedback about that. Right. Um, and I understand why then that unit is always set at 50%. Right. Um, and then if you can't find somebody, you know, you could sit with a vacant unit. So I think this 
Um, this makes more sense. So we'll have essentially three, three levels, mm -hmm. maybe four. Right. But as, as long as we get our affordable units, I think over and above that, it's sort of, you know, a good thing. We're gonna have some mixed income. Um, mm -hmm. It won't all be affordable and, and that we leave it up to the developers to figure out because the financing is gonna drive this. I mean, I've looked at a couple of other um, very recently approved uh, affordable housing developments. And some of them have used mass housing financing because there's workforce money there. Um, some of them have used, you know, other permanent financing. So it really, the, the, each one is specific to sort of the market area. And um, so I think, I think we'll find that, that developers might use different sources, but we can still achieve the same the same goal of getting some mixed income units. If we said 45, a minimum, it seems like a minimum of 45 units is kind of a lot. Affordable units? Well, I mean, what, what that we'd say that someone could do 15 on E Street and then 30 on Belchertown Road is that, I mean, we're not prescribing even that breakdown, but, um, you know. Yeah, I, you I, know. I mean, that's a decision, do we, is 45 too much? Is 40 a better number? I mean, is it, you know, what it about, I mean, we're saying the minimum number. So someone can always propose more. That's correct. And I wrote 40 to 45, <laughs> just yeah, I mean, as, if, you know, because I think, um, yeah, you know, we've heard that 45 is the max on tax credit right. deals now, just, you know, and people trying to structure them in Western Mass, um, that that's, you know, given the levels of subsidy that, that they need, that that's kind of the, that's the place. So I think, you know, we could go with 40 and somebody might come in with 45. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's not. But that's likely the range, 40 to 45. Yes. And yes. the next time we meet, we'll try to make a decision about what to make the minimum. Yeah. Sorry if I missed this, but are we giving them, is it an option for them to develop both sites or are they required to take on both sites? Can you say that again, Francis? I just I think missed. This is for both sites. So I think the this is for both they, sites. Yeah. So they, they won't have, it won't be an option to take the both. They'd have to do both. Yes. I mean, we have not talked about them picking one or the other. Yeah. Um, I think the thinking was that this came as a as a package. But right, what if someone right, what if someone came in and said, I'll just do 50 affordable units or 45 on Belchertown Road and I don't need to do the E Street School site? It's just too much. My concern would be, and I've said this before, the E Street School site, because it's a smaller site in terms of the developable right. land area, would become orphaned because it would be too small to be attractive by itself to a developer mm -hmm. and ultimately to DHCD. So as of now, my personal preference is to keep the package. Yeah. I mean, we're proposing it this way. I mean, we can see what responses, you know, what, what they look like. Yeah, if everybody says, I don't want to do them both, nobody says that they'll do them both, then I guess we have to think of something different, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Erica, did you think, did we capture everything in the affordability? But do you think, I mean, isn't it, isn't there some, like if you do workforce housing subsidy, does it sometimes, doesn't it compete or um, with like the low income housing tax credit program? Like, is there? It can complement it. It does or doesn't? It does. And it can be combined. I thought. All right. I thought when Valley CDC was going through Northampton Road, they made some statement about how it has to be, you know, something about like the way the 40B permit works. It doesn't, it sometimes it, some, you know, sometimes they can't use certain funding. I don't. Yeah, I just, I just know, you know, I've, I've got some numbers, you know, some development stuff from, um, uh, from MHP and then um, from Wayfinders about a deal that they're doing in 
Agawam with um, credits and with workforce housing. Yeah, was it a, a 40B project, you know? Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I'm really pretty sure Valley said that, which seems strange that you couldn't, there's some, DHCD had some problem with the restriction or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we, have we don't have to figure that out. Do we? we have no, examples we of existing projects. So yeah, yeah. It seems like it could happen. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, can, I'll ask if there's yeah. some conflict, but I don't believe so. I, mean, I like having the minimum number in the affordability <coughs> range and leaving the rest up to a developer to propose. Right. I mean, we're not. Do we make it like, for instance, in the comparative criteria? Would we say it's more advantageous if you can include market rate units? I mean, do we start structuring? the comparative criteria that way yes i think so because we, we don't want to <laughs> we don't want to underdevelop we don't want to overdevelop we don't want to underdevelop right i mean i think that uh carol particularly was concerned about too putting too many units on either site mm -hmm. so that everything would be kind of crammed together right um so I do think we need a minimum, but I think we may also want to do a maximum. That leads us to the next. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you so the, and the answer was yes, Rita. Yes. You covered everything. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So unit and bedroom configuration. I think the expectation is we're going to do one, two, and three bedroom units. Uh, John has started and I'm attempting to do some market research about what the demand is in Amherst. And we got some initial feedback from the Amherst Housing Authority uh, about their vouchers, not, not public housing, because this really isn't comparable to public housing, but the demand for vouchers. And um, surprisingly, their biggest, the, the greatest demand that they have is in one bedroom um, units. And, uh, but I think we, you know, we have wanted to focus on family housing because that's the, you know, the toughest to um, develop and, and to find. So that's more two and three bedroom units. So we still have some more um, research to do looking at some of the existing demand um, for other affordable housing developments in the town, um, other subsidized housing. So that's, that remains to be seen. Um, and we, so there's been no decision made, no recommendation made by the, um, by the committee. Uh, we would require a minimum of 10% of the units as three bedrooms simply because that's a DHCD requirement in the qualified action plan. And then again, I just wrote total development here. Do we put an upper number on there? Let's say we say a minimum of 40 affordable units. Do we put that um, cap on of no more than 65 units on the two sites? You know, when, when we did the initial, um, when we did the E Street RFP the first time around, we had some uh, some work's done by Kuhn Riddle, and I think the maximum number of units that they were looking at were in the 32 to 36 range there. But that was going up, I think, four stories. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, would we? Well, my thought is if we didn't, you know, for the trust, if we didn't have the total number of units here, some of the criteria is reviewing the concept designs and seeing how compatible yeah. they are with the neighborhood. So yeah. you know, leaving it up to the developer to come up with a design that works, not necessarily by, um, you know, by limiting it to a bedroom size. I guess one question I had is, um, do you think that with a, if, if developers are proposing 30% AMI, they would rather do like a studio than a one bedroom or would we consider a studio a one bedroom? Are we, are we gonna differentiate between the, that? Like, so say someone came in and said, you know, I'm going to, I'll do 40 affordable units and seven of them are going to be for 30% AMI and they're going to be studios. Do we object or do we want them to be like, you know, are, are we going to, you know, are we going to make a difference between a one bedroom and a studio? I mean, I personally think so. We're getting 28 studio apartments 
at 132 Northampton Road. So I think that as this is kind of the next project in line, I would rather not see studio apartments this, on either of these sites. Uh -huh. I mean, we're, we're, not, think, we're not gonna have yeah. a million units here. Yes, I think that um, maybe we can say something about um, a diverse mix of, you, of unit types per income uh, range. So that, you know, regardless of whether they're 30, 60 or 100, you still hopefully can have some one, two and threes. Right, but it sounds like we're going to say, I mean, essentially if we say one, twos and threes, we're excluding studios, which I mean, if that's, I just want to, you know, point that out. So if that's, you know, that, if we're okay with that, then, um, so, you know, I, sometimes I feel like, they, you know, a developer may want to do studios for the 30% AMI. No. I think that's fine. Well, I would agree with uh, John. I think we, yep. Yep, because we, I mean, we've spent a lot of um, time and support for the Northampton Road. And so I, I would agree that we start with two and three bedroom units, yep. one, two, and three. And do you think we need to say more than just an emphasis on two bedrooms? Like, are we actually trying to have a proportional formula or, you know, or is it just okay to say a mix of one to three with an emphasis on two bedroom? Are we actually trying to say, what do we say? Like, you know, 10% three bedroom and a percent for two bedrooms. Or are we just gonna kind of? Yeah, I, I wrote that, but that has not, a decision that hasn't been made. So yeah. by then. We, last time we had a strong emphasis on two bedroom. And I think depending on the results that we get back from Wayfinders and Beacon to complement what I've already learned from the Amherst Housing Authority, then we can decide how much emphasis to try to put on each of these. So right. I, I think a formula, but with some flexibility. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so we, in my understanding was we were waiting on the on getting the results and the mm -hmm. goal was to ask for the units that are most in demand to ask for the sizes that mm -hmm. are the the most in people's waiting lists or however in the world you look at it that it right <clears throat> right we could take a minimum 50 percent of the units be two bedroom and then if we have 10 percent, then someone can figure out you know the rest of it i mean but we're all of a sudden we're getting pretty prescriptive in the unit configuration well, you don't want anybody to come in with all one bedrooms either. Right. This, and this is supposed is just to be family for, housing. And is that, that and the, this bedroom count um, uh, is for total units, not just affordable, right? Total units, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I think, you know, we haven't agreed on the, the different criteria, but, right. you know, we have the uh, unacceptable advantageous and highly advantageous and that's where you'd have the percentage mm -hmm. you know, so for example 60 percent of units are two plus and at least 10 percent of three bedrooms that would be adv advantageous right, right. and it goes up but we just haven't agreed yet right okay yeah yeah no all right no that I like that sounds good then we can yeah um okay so moving along there are some things as I noted kind of in the um uh in the title here that uh, John and I had a meeting with with town staff after the um, so with with Nate and um, Dave Zomek and Rob Mora, who's the building commissioner. Commissioner, I was going to say, but I know he's not just a building inspector; he's a building commissioner. <laughs> um, around some design stuff. And there's clearly seems to be a, um, an interest in retaining the East Street School on the part of um, the town and um, the town officials when, when we met uh, with the understanding that, um, that that makes it more complex for developers. Some developers would just as soon not deal with the building like that. Some obviously really like it. But that if the um, if the developers was willing to incorporate the the East Street School building into the development proposal, that the town would be willing to um, entertain historic preservation money, possibly you know support 
a request for historic preservation money through um, CPA. And they might also be able to access historic credits. So it's a little bit different. And this, this is a case, again, where we would in the, um, I think in the criteria, um, have it highly advantageous if the, if the, the school building was retained. But the working group did not talk about this. So I just wanted to make sure everybody is clear on that. And um, it's open for discussion. It really, you know, it is up to the trust, but I wanted to put the, the town staff's preference out there. Comments? Do we, uh, do we know for sure that if a developer decided to demolish it, they would be allowed to? There's a, and Nate, correct me, there's a, um, the Historic Commission can put a one year uh, moratorium on demolition. And um, I'm not sure that they can absolutely prohibit it. It's just a moratorium, is that correct? Yeah, they would, issue, I mean, I think the commission, you know, they've looked at this, you know, they've been previewed this project and they said they would probably, you know, they would probably issue a delay. So they would put a 12 month delay on the prod, on the demolition of the building. So, you know. But at the end of the 12 months. Right, then it can come down, but it could come down earlier if, if, if a developer makes a compelling reason that they've exhausted all the alternatives to demolition, but. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of times someone will just wait the 12 months and then mm -hmm. and take it down. The point of- but I think you know, when, we did this early, when we did this earlier, uh, the RFP earlier for East Street, you know, that we didn't, we didn't have a stance about the building. And I think that, right. you know, you know if, if, you know, whether or not the town preference is included, uh, you know, I think it should be something that's part of a comparative criteria, just so it gives direction to, a, you know, a, an applicant, am I, you know, should I try to keep this thing or not? And then, you know, it can be part of the, the ranking because, um, you know, it, I think it has challenges for both, um, you know, for the site, uh, for keeping it or demolishing it. But I think, you know, it, it really does impact the, the site plan for this property, so. Allegra, you so didn't have to go to the East delay. Street School, did you? I think Sid, did Sid say he attended, he went to East Street? He might have. No, I don't think he's been in Amherst that long. Yeah, or maybe uh, he just likes the, he said he likes the building, but I'm always surprised yeah. I, who, who, uh, who I went to school there, but. Um, Erica, did you have? Well, I was gonna say with that delay, um, you know, the process and the progress, if there's going to be a one year moratorium, um, that they can't move on the site if they decide that they actually absolutely can't utilize the site and need to rebuild. Not necessarily. I mean, no. they could apply for a demolition, I think prior to go in for a comprehensive permit and before they apply to DHCD for funding. So if they do that, then those processes will take them more than a year. So the demolition delay wouldn't necessarily hurt the project very much. It or might delay it just, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you didn't know whether or not you were demolishing the building and had to wait, you really can't submit your permit until you have gone through that process. So- Yeah, um, I think it adds a little bit of risk. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, for Valley for 132 Northampton Road, you can, you can roll the demolition request into the comprehensive permit. You may want to uh, do it ahead of time if you think it'll start the, uh, the top, the clock ticking, but you know, it is, there, there is a risk there that, um, you know, I don't, you know, but for instance, if we said, well, you have to keep the school, you know, does that, is that also <laughs> become something that developers may not want to, right? So it's just, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it could put developers off bidding on the project entirely. So I don't think I would want that to be an absolute restriction myself. Yeah. I think one of the and things that maybe- When you say school, 
Go ahead, Erica. <laughs> I was just going to say, when you say school, do you mean the whole building? Because I know that when the casino was built, there were fronts that were used, but not necessarily the whole buildings. I think it's uh, a whole, whole building. This is reusing the building for yeah. apartments. So not, yeah. you know, keeping okay. a facade, but really. <laughs> um, and what about C, Rita? How much site and building design work is going to be required, right? This is to submit a proposal. Well, you had raised that, Nate, in our, yeah. in our discussion. I only put it in there because I think it's not something we're going to resolve tonight, right. but it's just something for that the, um, that the working group uh, we'll be talking about looking at what we asked for previously from the um, developers and was that too much was that too little uh, right. you know my my caution as we're doing the RFP is this is um, the trust one shot at um, saying what it wants because once the developer is selected the um, the trust and the town, it, with the exception of the boards that are reviewing applications, um, can't negotiate anything. You, you can't issue an RFP, get a proposal back, and then rework whatever the developer came in with. That is a violation of, um, of the law, and, and the whole thing could be thrown out. Um, and you, you just, you can't do that. You could have other developers come in and challenge and say, wait a minute, if I had known you were going to negotiate that, then I would have, you know, I would have put something different in my proposal. So, um, so th this is the time and that's why you want to have a really clear and uh, well thought out RFP because you don't get to revisit it again. Um, of course, right. so, I mean, would you, CBA you know, last will time we do it. The but... last time we asked for scale drawings, though, we asked for, you know, essentially like a scaled site plan and elevations. And, you know, would we not, I mean, it sounds like Rita, you're saying that we should um, still have that requirement for a scale draw, you know, for something that's a little bit more, more than say, just like a concept plan. So we may, we may have called it a concept plan, but in the RFP, we actually said we want it, you know, scaled and had a number of kind of parameters for those drawings. And it also helps, I know, review the proposal and the, everything, but, um, you know, I yeah, know Valley had said, well, that is, a, that is a lot up front. Like for instance, what if they said, oh, what if we realized we could keep the school, but we didn't have enough time before we submitted the RFP and the program does change, you know, what does that look like? So I guess I was thinking if we keep a pretty rigorous, um, you know, some of this stuff is we expect a lot. Maybe we just have to have a longer time frame for people to submit responses. You know, I, I think last time we tried to have a pretty quick turnaround, which, mm -hmm. you know, we ended up ex extending, but it was just kind of messy the way we had to, you know, issue an addendum to extend it and then. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can do that. And if, if it's just a matter of, um, of time, we can give people a longer period of time to, to respond to get this done. I mean, putting a response to an RFP uh, together is an expense for a developer. I mean, they have to spend money and they have to get drawings done and they have to you know, put a lot of thought into it. And that's just a risk that they take. That's, that's part of being a developer. You, you take those risks. From the town's perspective and from the trust perspective, you know, the developer is getting approximately a million dollars worth of property. Right. And so for us to say, you know, go out and spend $20,000 to put your RFP together and put this is, is nothing in terms of what we're giving them. So I don't think it's unreasonable to, um, to, to ask developers. And I think it's also a reflection back on the developer. If they can't if they can't come up with the money to put together a good RFP, how are we expecting them to do a $15 million development? Right. Um, so to have the wherewithal. So, you know, that's the, this is, this is not, you know, building 10 units somewhere. This is like 50 to 60 multifamily units um, that, you know, on, on land that's being essentially given to them uh, through a long-term lease that's not gonna cost them anything.
Yeah, so, you're, you're talking, Rita, it made me think, if we were asking for that, do you think the developers want, would want like a CAD file? Maybe, Francis, I don't know what you think. So we, we can get one for the E Street School. We finally, you know, we have a survey and we have the wetland surveyed and it's on one plan. So I'm trying to get the, the CAD file now. Mm -hmm. But the Belgian yes. Road, I don't think we have a CAD file. So, you know, yeah. again, it would just be like the town's GIS. I think, yeah, the GIS, yeah. any survey work that's been done. Uh, of course, for the E Street School, the evaluation of hazardous mm -hmm. materials, because that'll mm -hmm. be really important to assess how much it'll cost to remediate versus the teardown. Uh, but yes, basically anything we have that would be useful to them in order to both design the site plan as well as the, the cost associated with any mitigation is helpful. Yeah. And we yeah, gave yeah. them all of that stuff on the East Street School, all of the, um, all of the building research that we had. We gave the, the access to that in the last RFP. Yeah, and I think oh, we had a we link. We didn't. Off. It was supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah, no, we had links. I don't know if they worked, but we also have our GIS layers, which can be <laughs> downloaded. But um, I was well, they better work this they, time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of times they do like to have the the CAD file. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. It was supposed to be there. There you go. But just so everybody knows, um, when when we when the the trust drafts the RFP. It um, then goes to staff at town hall. And so I think this time we just want to make sure that um, it comes full circle back to the, the trust because we, we didn't see the final document that went out because uh, it goes out through the procurement office at town hall. Um, and that won't happen again. <laughs> No more comments. <laughs> um, other questions on the development design? Um, so we broke out um, the, the, again, the working group had some really great um, suggestions. Uh, we had incorporated originally into development design um, areas which really fell more into sustainability that we wanna highlight. And so we broke this out as, an, as a new, um, section and uh, you know the the first thing and I included this in sustainability it's not I'm not sure where maybe it doesn't belong here but um, with the East Street school there there are essentially kind of two two parcels there's the front parcel um, which has the school building and runs along um, East, East Street, Street there. And then in the back of that, there's a parcel that has been a playing field in the past that's very wet, is not buildable, and um, has a culvert that crosses under a little paved area. So we're, I, we, we haven't resolved with, um, with the town yet. And when I say with the town, with, um, Dave Stomach and Nate and Rob and John and I have been talking about what happens with that, with that back parcel. Does a developer want access to that? It's open space, it can never be developed, but you could have, you know, you could have a, a little play structure back there. You could have some, you know, a walking path. It um, connects, it could connect to Watson Farms, which is a family public housing development. I think this, they do use that field now. Um, at some point that field was used for, you know, more uh, formal recreation. Oh, thank you for yeah, so pulling here's that the, up. This is the property. Yep. So we're right here in the yellow. Mm -hmm. So you can see that that, that back piece is a, a good sized um, piece of land and, and Watson Farms kind of surrounds part of it and then um, you know the houses on on Southeast Street there back up onto it and that's the school and then here's the other developable area. Mm -hmm. So you know we could separate this off um, or we could just leave it all as one parcel and um, 
You know, I think depending upon what developer you talk to, some would say, I don't really want to take care of that. I'd rather just let the town take care of it because it just means extra work and, you know, mowing and so forth. Um, uh, but some developers might say, yeah, that's, that's a feature that's really nice to have as part of the, um, as part of the, the rental development. And because there's such a narrow neck there, um, it, it's hard to, to provide access, you know, like a, an easement from Southeast Street there to the back parcel. Um, you know, if it was going to be used, if the, if the town was going to control it. Actually, last time we did have a provision that the town would maintain that back lot and uh, be responsible for it. And the developer needed to provide an easement across right. the, from the front lot uh, that would allow people to access the back lot. And right, I think, yeah, so what we're saying is, you know, there'd be a 10 or 12 foot wide easement to get, you know, a mower down here. But the, uh, the difficult thing is depending on how you develop the site plan, you know, mm -hmm. we're not saying it has to be a straight easement. All of a sudden it might go through parking lots and it, you know, goes around a building and then comes in. So oh, I, wow. yeah, I, you know, I know Tom was not enthusiastic about if he were developing this to keep, you know, that the liability and the access, all that complicates a site design here, because, you know, if you want to have an easy access, you basically have a 12 foot wide strip just right, right down the side here, which maybe isn't a big deal, but you know, it's a, it has to be a, almost a paved access drive to get back here. And if you're requiring or that you're, you really want the school retained, mm -hmm. it just becomes that much more um, right. onerous to have that easement. Right. Yeah. And then if you have an easement on the other side of the school, then you're telling people you have access, you know, through this, through this housing development to that back parcel where you can go and have pick up soccer games or whatever. And it, you know, I think it's, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, you it's have the street. For the working, yeah, I think for the working group and then the trust, I think that is a big consideration. You know, what, what we want to have happen with this field. At one point we're saying it would, you know, the town would maintain it and it would be open to the public. But then, right, we're then saying that the public would, you know, could park on Southeast Street, but then they would have, you know, there'd be an easement through someone, through another project to get to this this back right. field. And right. you know, I think there are some questions about how does that work uh, with, you know, depending on how this is developed. And so yeah, I don't, you know, the towns, you know, we also mentioned could we get access through Watson Farms, but yeah, I mean I think maybe the working group, right? If if what if there's a preference that, you know, it maybe it's only open to the development or to the neighborhood or I, you know, I don't know. It's not, you know, all to the public. So. It's going to be open to the public anyway. I mean, what's going to stop anybody from walking through there and going back in there and playing? I, why make it a problem? Just let it be open. It's going to be anyway. So, but you can make it. You can make it open through having a you know having a, a public easement, or you can just assume people are going to go back there. Like the people from Watson Farms, for example, those those kids could use that as a you know, to play soccer or whatever back back there, but that you're not opening it up in a stated way, like bring your teams here, walk through this property and go back and have have games back there. Right, yeah. and I think some of it is the liability, you know, if we'd have to then very clearly articulate an easement or something so that the developer and owner of the housing on East Street is not responsible or anything that happens here along the easement because that, you know i think that's the issue so you know yeah, um, right sense. if we're if we're if we're you know if they if it, this is just you know casually open to people someone could put a sign up and say you know basically like, use at your own risk and it could waive them of liability but if essentially the town's going to promote this as oh here's a neighborhood mm -hmm. park you know little league and softball teams can come back here and use it that's a whole different story than um you know it's just a an open area. So yeah, I think it is interesting to consider. So I think that's something that um, working group members will be talking about. Mm -hmm. 
If, go if anybody the else side. on the trust has uh, some thoughts, we'd love to hear it about how to, to retain it, not have the easement, um, assume retain that it. it's part of the development. We may ultimately need legal advice related to <laughs> what we can or should do with respect to that. Well, yeah. it's part of the it's part of the E Street School site, so I think we have to. Um, the only legal advice would be is if we wanted to provide public access to it or allow public access, because otherwise it's 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 part of the development, and just like anybody else's property. You know your ability to go onto it is really at the will of the of the owner. Okay, so let's go on to the next okay. issue. Well, the one thing I'll, I'll say though, you know, at, at um, Dave mentioned it a little bit, Rita, you know, when we were on the call, that you know this here is the Route Nine properties, the Belchertown Road properties. Yeah. They this this area back here is conser town conservation land now, and so they're. You know, there is there is a mowed trail here, but there's you know the town's actually going to develop this with, you know, walking trail and maybe community gardens and um, some in some leasable space or licensed space for you know bigger uh, farming. But you know there was a thought about having a pedestrian connection from you know maybe for just the residents of this of this development to this property. Again, I don't think the idea was to have a public access point through this property. I, I didn't understand it that way, but you know, my thought is if, if there's a connection here, maybe as a highly advantageous site design, the developer you know, makes an effort to show a you know, connection between these two sites. I, I don't know if that's worthwhile to, to pursue or, you know, it's just because otherwise they have to, you know, there's, you know, they would have to go on the sidewalk and walk, you know, walk back and get to it. You know, it'd be so much quicker to have a path through here, but I don't, you know, I don't know if that's worth considering. Well, Dave, or... Dave talked about having a path and also including in the path a little footbridge over a stream that would allow yeah. access to the playing fields behind Fort River School. Oh, that's something the town's doing though. Yes, that's what I meant. I don't yeah. think it's something we would expect the developer to do. Right, because the access for this would be, the town has an easement over, talk about easements, um, down through here, and then the access to this property is here. So if you know if someone lived here, it's not that far of a walk, but you know you do have to go on the street and then walk through here to get all the way back here. Um, yeah, I think we should talk about what those plans are and mm -hmm. what we might ask a developer to do. But to do some whole network of walking paths back there, I think is probably. Um, yeah, I mean it. It is a little wet right here, but. I don't think it's I don't think it's considered wetland though. I don't know the extent of the wetland on this, but yeah. Well, let's move on to the next set of issues. Okay, so just I just want to highlight that you know um, within the development design, the hazardous materials evaluation has been completed for the um, the East Street School. So we know that there's asbestos in there and there's lead and some other stuff um, and um, there's a cost estimate that's being put together. So I forgot to mention that. Um, so also with sustainability, um, just having language around um, green, sustainable, climate resilient design. And um, again, the degree of detail that will require has to be discussed with the, um, with the, the the working group, but this language is um, taken directly from the um, qualified action plan of DHCD. So that's what they're looking for. And I think that's what we're looking for too. And then uh, just in terms of, of wetlands, there are wetlands at both sites and um, town staff are um, preparing the, it's called the RDAs for the wetlands at both, both sites. So. We're doing, you know, more due diligence, um, more research to make it easier for developers to know exactly what can and can't be done. So when someone turns in their RFP, they will have access to the the yes. determinations of wetlands. Will be, they will mm -hmm. have those in their hands, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. 
as well as you know all this other material that we know about the East Street School and the surveys and all the rest of that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the other couple of things that we've talked about are the, um, uh, the management and maintenance plan and um, and I think you know we have to refine that, but those are definitely things that we're um, interested in in hearing about. And again, when we had this discussion with with town staff, I think there was some concern about again not requiring like a whole management and maintenance plan, you know, that takes many hours and could cost thousands of dollars to put together. So we just have to make sure that we have language. We wanna know kind of what the basic parameters are without having a management and maintenance plan for a development that hasn't even, hasn't been done. But I think using previous examples as a way, examples of, of what the developers have done in the past and then getting them to agree to um, elements that we want included, things that, that we think are priorities for um, such as eviction procedures, things that we want to see in the management plan. And, um, and then fair housing and equal opportunity, um, again, with a marketing plan, uh, they don't have to do a marketing plan specific because we don't know exactly what the development is yet, but um, previous marketing plans and making sure that, um, that every effort is being made to um, ensure that underserved populations are encouraged to apply for the housing. And a couple of things just to add that I didn't put in here, but that Erica had sent along um, a couple of suggestions. And, and one was making sure that um, we include a, a value statement in the narrative, um, which I think is really important. And um, just before, just later today, I know Erica, you had sent along um, some really good material. I, I don't know who developed it, somebody at the state around affirmative fair housing, mar not affirmative marketing and serving, making sure we're serving underserved populations. Can you just, I don't have it right in front of me. So I thought I had taken notes, but. Sure. Um, I think it, those were the principles yes. uh, and guidance on how to use the principles. So uh, at yeah, at DPH, we actually have a racial equity procurement group that's looking at our procurement process. And so one of the things that um, we decided was is that we would put these principles, uh, attach them to the RFRs so people understood exactly what our expectations were. Um, I think sometimes some of the concepts and principles can be a little bit um, general and not very specific, but it was an opportunity to provide the values that we're expecting the applicants to have and to then demonstrate. Um, so it's a set of principles and it's pretty extensive, yeah, um, but we, we do use them for our RFR. Yeah, I think they're probably more extensive, extensive than we just from a from a cursory review of them, more extensive than what we want to yeah. include. But I think that there are certainly parts of them, and um, maybe we can share them with the rest of the trust members because I think they were really um, good. And so they, would they become part of the comparative criteria? You know, I was thinking again for the fair housing one. Um, you know, you're saying uh, how do you look at that or how do we know that they're addressing or making a good effort um, at marketing? I mean, you know, would in some of the comparative criteria, would we say like a highly advantageous would be engaging like a community liaison or holding different meetings? And so, you know, are we, are, you know, because this is a category, right? I mean, this is mm -hmm. actually a review criteria. So right. we'd have to come up with, you know, what we think is the most advantageous. So we could right. say, you know, here like, did, you know, it is the, the marketing plan that was submitted or their efforts, does it document that they, you know, held community meetings or had a community relations person or, you know, and then advantageous is different, right? So we're assuming we're gonna have, you know, we could build on this a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing some research on that and I'll have some ideas to share with the draft RFP committee 
or working group right. in a and couple just, of weeks. Just quickly, uh, sorry, just quickly, um, the what's required for DHCD for any DHCD related money, they do require the affirmative housing uh, for marketing plan, um, the all the management and maintenance plans uh, before they get any sort of financing from them and the banks require them too. So, you know, this would be thinking about if we want to do anything in addition to what is required there. And again, if they apply for light tech, everything is also reviewed by HUD. Um, so it's multiple layers that already are doing this too. So it's thinking about what if any added value we can bring to it. Well, I like the idea under the management plan, you know, maybe not requiring a separate service plan, but saying, you know, how are they going to do referrals or, you know, I think, um, you know, something like that is nice because oftentimes I haven't, you know, we haven't seen that in a management plan. Yeah, I, I think the principles that, um, uh, that Erica sent out are really good. And I'd like to look through that and see yeah, what. Yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't see that email. So it'd be great, yeah. uh, Erica or Rita, if someone, if you sent it to the whole trust, I think that'd be really yes. helpful. Yeah, okay. I feel like I'd send it to- Yeah, I, great. Uh, if, I wasn't certain if I could send it to everybody. Yeah, so I just sent actually, it to Rita and John. If, um, I'll forward you it to you, Nate, and then maybe you can send it yeah. out. How yeah. would that be? Okay. Yeah, that, that, yeah, Erica, Erica and everybody else, if you just want to send information out to the entire housing trust, you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you just, it just has to be clear to everybody that it's not for a uh, online conversation. The only conversation we can have about it is during an active meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but you can send information out for people's inf uh, curiosity or review, whatever, uh, without violating the open meeting law. Just can't talk about it. Yeah. Great, so that's um, that's the summary. We, the working group meets again on February 25th, 26th? 25th, 25th, 25th in two weeks. In two weeks. Um, and what um, we're hoping to do is to make some more progress on these criteria and also on the, the the categories. So I'm going to take a um, an attempt at, at writing up some of the, the categories based on the outline criteria we have now. But stay tuned. Great job summarizing it. Thanks. And I'm actually going to sign off. Um, so. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Okay, yeah, I, I feel like we're I feel like we're in good shape. I feel like we have a good, yeah. a really good um, process and format. So, you know, there's probably those few questions we have to really answer, like the school building or. <laughs> but we're moving ones. along quite well. We are, yeah. No, I, yeah, right. yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Thank Rita. You. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say in terms of a schedule. Um, my hope is that we have something verging on a fairly complete draft of the main parts of the RFP for discussion at our March housing trust meeting. And if that's the case, then we can move to getting a full draft of the RFP, maybe by the end of March or early April. And then that gets turned over to Anthony Delaney, who's the town procurement officer uh to put the finishing touches on it um i'm also uh downplaying a little bit nate's role nate still has a significant role in getting together the information about hazardous materials about the delineation of wetlands and other things so uh he also still has a significant role to play uh before we have a full draft I was taking oh. a back seat, John. I, I kind of like that. <laughs> um, there are two other things that I had. Actually, the other thing that I put down is Nate is working on getting our ducks in a row, so to speak. Uh, Rita already mentioned the work on hazardous materials, which is um, work that he initiated. We have He has a contractor, and the contractor is going to give us 
uh, estimates of the costs of removing those which will go into the request for proposals. And we also hope that before the RFP goes out, we'll have wetlands delineation uh, blessed by the Conservation Commission. So again, there's no uncertainty for the point of view of the developer about where she or he can or cannot build. So that kind of pretty much completes discussion, I think, of the RFP, unless somebody has a question. Um, okay, the next item I had is report on state legislation. And it's still pretty early in the session. Um, on the other hand, I just wondered, Will, if you had anything you wanted to let people know about. Yeah, um, this should be pretty quick. But uh, so basically, I, <laughs> I only read, found this on Tuesday when the Western Massachusetts uh, Network 10 homelessness posted about it. But uh, um, the governor just released their the, the, the draft budget for fiscal year 2022. Um, I guess he did at end of January. Um, and it entails a whole number of cuts to uh, different, you know, eviction prevention and rental assistance programs uh, and other uh, things that you know the trust would be interested in doing or in advocating uh, for, um, and uh, I, I haven't gone through the the bill itself or, or the the chapa summary in, in the specifics um, to really summarize it for you all in, in depth right now. Um, but um, this isn't a, a process that I mean we we do have time to sort of figure out how we want to advocate um, for you know. Or, or discuss exactly what it is we want to advocate for and, and, and plot out a strategy together. So um, my hope is just to have for our next meeting, just a, a sort of a little write out of uh, what this budget, how it differs from 2021 um, and uh, you know some suggestions for where to, or how to discuss like what exactly the trust wants to advocate for. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I think for our next meeting, we can have a, a discussion about what this proposal looks like and, and what we want to do about it. Yeah. I'll mention one other thing. Um, this is unusual, but the legislature is giving senators and uh, representatives until I believe it's February 19th to submit new legislation. So if anybody has any ideas for new legislation, I would recommend that uh, you get some idea about that to either Joe Comerford or Mindy Dom in the next few days. So I think that wraps up our legislative report. Then I had a few things, brief, brief updates. One I still don't have anything on, but uh, let's see. Um, town housing policy. I sent out the most recent draft of the town housing policy to everybody. Uh, I hope to carve out some time to talk about that and it'll probably change again between now and the next time we meet because the community resource committee continues to meet. That's not their only focus, but it is one of their uh, main agenda items now. And I think they're trying to uh, wrap up a draft of the policy and hold some public meetings by the end of March or early April. Uh, so if we're going to have some input to that, we really need to give it to them uh, in the near future. If anybody has had a chance to look at it uh, and you have comments, you can submit them to me or Nate, and then we can pass them along to Mandy Jo Haneke, who was the chair of the uh, Community Resources Committee. Yeah, so John, I just believe, yeah, he sent an email out at quarter to seven, and there was, uh, you know, I think right is the most up to date policy. It's uh, as of draft, yeah. Before. So, yeah. yeah, my apologies. It's one of those things that I thought I sent out two or three days ago, but it just disappeared. <laughs> is that in the <laughs> in the form? The is that in the form of a letter from Mandy Joe? It's a mix. Is that what that is? That there, there is a a memorandum. Uh, a memo from her, and then past the memorandum, there's a draft of the uh, town housing policy. That's all in the same PDF. It's all in the same, the, had, file. the same yep. file. Thank yep. you. Thank you. 
Yeah, yes. it's only a short twenty-page policy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how nice! <laughs> or, uh, or whatever it is, it's like a fifteen. No, it's maybe like thirteen pages. But I, um, yeah, they are looking for comments, and you know, they did. You know, John presented a few times to the CRC in the last year and a half, and so some of the language is familiar. And then there's you know a fair amount of new new changes. So I think, you know, yeah, I, I do think a fresh look at it, John, by the trust would be good. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to say, it also asks a question, you know, it's like, you know, goal number one, high priority 40R asking us, what is the current position of the Amherst um, Affordable Trust? I mean, the AMHT in terms of our position. So there's, there's specific things that it's asking for had defined affordable slots. Mm -hmm. I haven't read this to say I know what, yeah, to know what they're asking, but all right. Yeah, I've skimmed it, but again, I also haven't studied in detail. So Neither. I haven't prepared any responses myself. Yeah, page four, I want to hear from the uh, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. So yeah, I think there is a lot where they're asking us our opinion. All right, yeah, so we can, yeah, so John sent that out. If you have questions, you know, you can email John or myself and we can always uh, try to get answers too. So if you had questions on some of this, we could always work through, and I, I can work through staff to ask Mandy, Joe, or whoever, you know, someone on the CRC, if that, you know, if there were some big questions the trust had or members had. Can I ask, a, this is just a question of what's, uh, what one is supposed to do. I'm, we're supposed to send comments to you. We are not supposed to respond, for instance, to Mandy Joe, who sent the letter. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Uh, yeah, I think ideally Mandy Joe would like a consolidated response from the housing trust okay. as opposed to every one of us send, sending in our own comments. Yeah, I think, you know, before next meeting, if members read the policy, send me comments, I'll, I'll send them as I get them. And then before next meeting, I'll just consolidate all the comments into one document again and send that out. And then if there are questions, so if a trust member has questions about what the document means, include those in your comments. And then I'll, I'll ask that of, of, you know, I can communicate through the town manager's office to see if they can, you know, have the CRC answer those. So thank you. Know, you. I, yeah. Okay. Uh, look at my notes. Yeah. The next item was, uh, there was supposed to be a new regional report on housing and the absence of housing generally and affordable housing in particular, uh, that was, is under, I guess, development by the Donahue Institute. And I thought it would be out around now, but as of the end of the day today, I hadn't seen anything. Uh, so it should be out hopefully within a week or less. Um, I heard about it from Keith Ferry, who's the executive director of Wayfinders. And he was part of a committee that was working with the Donahue Institute on the design of this report. So uh, interested to see it when it comes out and I will share it with everyone when it becomes available. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is a future agenda item. I had at least promised Erica that we would uh, uh, talk about the Housing Trust strategic plan and I hope to do that, get that some squeezed into our next meeting. I think there are two things specifically that I would hope to review. And again, I'll send this out as part of our agenda. One would be to look at the things that were already existing in the strategic plan and kind of say, okay, how are we doing on all of these things? And are we happy with our progress? Or is there some areas in which we think we need to have more effort? And then there are now two or three significant areas of new work that are now goals in our strategic plan. So the second part of the discussion would be, okay, how are we gonna organize ourselves in order to try to meet these goals as well? And 
the goal that sticks with me is uh, the idea of finding additional sources of funding beyond what we now have. Uh, and again, I'll provide a summary of what sources we do have. The main source right now is still Community Preservation Act funding, but there are a few other small, smaller sources uh, for funding of a ho affordable housing in town uh, that is local resources that I will mention. But the bigger question is, okay, how do we do better in the future? So th that's the biggest one that I recall, Erica. Uh, and so uh, everybody who knows how to raise money should be considering <laughs> how we go after that in the future. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's pretty much um, the things that I had on the agenda for tonight. Uh, next month, we'll review the minutes for both this meeting and uh, the January meeting. I did send them out, but obviously not in enough time to give people a chance to review them. So my apologies again for that. And we'll do both sets of minutes in advance or when we meet in, in March. Other questions or comments? There's still a few members of the public, John. I don't know if you want to ask for public comment. Okay, yeah. Uh, I see Maura Keen and Jim Linfield. Do either of you have any comments or questions? Okay, then I think we're probably ready to adjourn. Uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Okay, I don't think I, I, will, I don't <laughs> think I'll do a roll call. Is all those in favor raise your hand? Whoops, or your thumb or something. And it looks like that's unanimous.